I think it goes without saying that uh, in today's political and economic climate, I can't think of a better time to be thinking and moving forward more strategically. And as I thought about it, I can't think of a better person to really speak on the topic than Scott Townsley, our speaker for today. Scott is a consultant that has, he has specialized in strategy and aging services for the past 30 years, working with reputable firms such as Clifton Larson Allen and Third Age. But he currently is the principal and founder of newly formed Trilogy Consulting. But in addition to that, he is professor of the practice at UMBC Aging and co-founder and board member for the Center for Innovation. The Center for Innovation is the organization that has helped to move the Greenhouse Project from its former sponsor to not just a new sponsor, but really to help us envision a whole new strategic direction into the future. I can tell you, as a previous student for UMBC Aging's graduate program, I can personally acknowledge the extraordinary insights and critical thinking that Scott brings to the conversation and the strategic design that's necessary for the future. Scott is a well-known speaker. He has, has thought out, whether it's a board presentation or a national conference, um, he's a speaker whose insights are appreciated to by those wanting to learn, grow, and to sharpen their strategic thinking skills so that they can more proactively create a roadmap for success. So today, before we get started, I want to remind you that your phones are muted, but should you have a comment or a question, there is a chat box that Rachel will be monitoring. So feel free to utilize the chat box if you do have a question or comment. And so without further ado, I want to turn it over to you, Scott. Thanks, Susan. That's a, a very kind introduction and, and much appreciated. Um, good morning to those in the West and um, good afternoon to those of you in the East. Um, this afternoon, <clears throat> I'm, I'm going to take this subject and uh, kind of divide it into three parts. And as I was getting ready for um, today, it, it occurred to me that um, uh, the three dimensions of my background will come into play. So the first is I'm going to talk about some trends um, and, and how they underscore the importance of, of strategy and, and um, I'd argue for a different way of thinking. Um, and that kind of draws on my consulting background. Um, I'll then in introduce Blue Ocean Strategy, uh, talk about its philosophy, uh, the background for it, um, and, and how it works. And I'll particularly focus on something that's referred to as the strategy canvas. And for those of you who have used Blue Ocean before, you'll, you'll know what I mean, but I'll, I'll cover that. And that, I think, draws on um, the, the work that I do on the academic side um, at the Erickson School or UMBC Aging. Um, and then lastly, I'm going to use Greenhouse uh, Project, Greenhouses in particular, um, as sort of the test case for Blue Ocean. And, and show you how Blue Ocean could have led to um, the development of the greenhouse, but also how Blue Ocean um, will be leading to continued innovations uh, in, the, in the greenhouse. So um, the four challenges, and I'll put them in that uh, category, the four challenges I'll talk about are, um, are all focused on um, long-term care, um, nursing homes, if you will, um, to a degree, I'm going to include in my comments post-acute care. If we had a lot more time this afternoon, uh, we could talk more broadly about trends in, uh, in aging services. But um, you'll hear me focus on that area of long-term care. I, I don't want you to think that um, you know, either Greenhouse Project or Center for Innovation um, are ignorant of, of the other things that are going on that, that obviously have an impact. Um, so with that, um, let me talk a bit about the environment, and this is um, kind of how I have thought about where we are um, in the long-term care field, both for-profit and not-for-profit. Um, I, I wish I could tell you there was a different way to phrase this, but um, I think that many of us are long past the time when, um, when we were ignorant of the fact that um, long-term care and nursing homes uh, are in abhorrence to the public in general. And I could prove that out with a variety of studies, but um, suffice it to say, at least um, allow me to say at this point, that um, the fundamental product of nursing home care in the United States is not a product that's embraced by the consumer. 
There is an increasing number of alternatives. I'll, I'll pop some out as we as we talk forward. Um, and when you take the impact of healthcare reform, what you have is, and I'll, I'm going to talk specifically about healthcare reform and the American Healthcare Act and where we are with it. I'll talk about that in a few moments. But it, it drives many of the trends down, um, and that's a concern. So um, here's some data that ran through 2012 in terms of nursing home utilization rates, and that's the, for um, utilization of nursing home beds per residence, um, 1,000 age 65 or older. I could show it to you for 75, I could show it to you for 85, but the trend line um, is exactly the same. And you can see that um, that's been going on for a decade. Um, truth be told, if I showed you what was happening in 1993 and 1983, that utilization rate decline would, would be there as well. Um, this is um, for a particular state. Um, happens to be where I was um, raised, uh, maintained a, uh, a firm for a number of years, uh, Pennsylvania. Um, and it's largely true of most other states. It's not, it's not true across the entire uh, country, state by state, but it is true taking the United States as, as a whole. Um, if, you take, if you take that trend line um, and you see it going in 2000 from uh, 44 uh, people age one, uh, 44 people uh, age 65 or older per 1,000 in a nursing home, and it's declined to 38 uh, or so in 2014, that over um, an extended period of time you could conclude that there will be no nursing homes. I don't think that's the right conclusion. But I think that the question we ought to be asking ourselves is uh, over time, and I don't mean a decade, I mean over time as in five years uh, or less, what will nursing homes look like? So um, some of you may already have picked up, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, there's a flaw in what Scott's telling us because he's just talking about nursing home utilization, um, and we need to account for the fact that there's a growing population who are 75 plus or 85 plus or 65 plus. So you are the exactly right um, that um, that increasing number of elders or older adults, um, while the trend line on nursing home utilization um, isn't uh, isn't changing, the occupancy is impacted by that. In other words, take um, 40 beds per thousand population age 65 plus that are occupied, um, and increase the number of older adults in the state by X number. And in theory, occupancy would increase. But similarly, if you decrease the nursing home utilization rate from 35 or 40 to whatever it's becoming as we sit here in 2017, um, occupancy may likely tend to fall. And I'm, I'm a little bit hesitant in making a prediction other than um, to say occupancy rates are going to continue to fall. What I don't know is, is uh, how quickly the rate of decrease in occupancy will accelerate. And so I'm waiting to see some 2015 and, and 16 uh, data. But it leads to this. And this is from uh, Nick, the National Investment Center, who does a great job of collecting data and information um, about our field or our industry. Um, and so in, in the uh, large graph here, and I, I'll pause here and, and um, tell you that the slides will be available to you in PDF format um, after today's um, webinar. But you can see that um, occupancy from 2012 uh, through 2016 has taken a hit. So even at, at a time when the, the number of people um, who are aging is increasing, um, that declining utilization rate is taking the occupancy down. So on the right-hand side, probably more difficult to see, but um, equally as important is I'm going to start at the bottom. Um, the percentage of private pay nationally has been decreasing. Um, percentage Medicare, uh, interesting, I'll just use my cursor here, uh, is decreasing. Um, managed Medicare is increasing overall, and Medicaid is increasing in terms of uh, payment or bed days within nursing homes. Um, you know, frankly, um, the, the lifeblood of, of many nursing homes are their Medicare and their private pay rate. And so we see not only occupancy declining, but Medicare and, and private as well. Well, couple that with what's happening um, with payment. And here I wanted to pause uh, for just a couple of minutes to talk about um, healthcare reform. 
Um, a couple of Saturdays ago, I was um, teaching um, uh, one of my courses with graduate students. Um, the course is social entrepreneurship, but as I started the course that day, I, I asked them to tell me what they knew about the American Health Care Act. Um, and, and some knew a little, some hadn't really paid attention to it. Um, and so we, we talked about it for a while, and, and what I said to the, to the class, and, and, I, and I would say that even with the House not voting on the American Health Care Act, we're, um, you know, when it comes to health care, we're in um, maybe at best a chaotic time, um, and at worst, um, we're able to see policy um, being made. Whether we think it's being made effectively or ineffectively is not the point of, of uh, my comments here. But we're in the midst of watching policy be shaped um, that will have an impact for coming years. Um, but here's what's important. Um, having read through the American Health Care Act um, as it was originally written, um, as, as you probably know if you're paying attention to, um, to, the, to the act, as changes were being made in negotiations, um, the act itself um, was not necessarily being updated. But the published version of the act um, focused on um, and in case I haven't been clear, this is the act that Congress was um, going to consider and then the bill was um, retracted or pulled uh, Friday afternoon. The act um, talked a lot about um, Medicaid. Um, it talked a lot about the repeal of taxes. Um, it um, did two interesting things. One, it made clear that if you um, won a lottery in a state, and you were a millionaire as a result, you could not qualify for Medicaid. Apparently, that was an important thing to, to reference. That actually took several pages. Um, and it also had removed the tax on tanning salons, um, effective December 31st, 2017. You, you always ask yourself, why, did, why do things like that get into an act like this? But here was, here's what was missing um, from the American Health Care Act. What was missing was substance dealing with um, health care reform as it's been impacting nursing homes across the country. And there's a lot of other things substantively that it was missing. It was much more of a tax and procedural bill than, than, than anything else. The reason that that's important is that I've made the observation before, it's not unique, um, but in 2006, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services developed a strategic plan um, for long-term care and post-acute care. If you look back at that strategic plan, you would see that everything that has happened up until this point in terms of bundle payment, in terms of value-based payment, in terms of providers needing to be willing to accept risk and increasing increasing amount of risk. All of that was in the strategic plan circa 2006. It ends up being included in the Affordable Care Act uh, that was passed in 2010. It wasn't touched by the American Health Care Act. And so what I'm saying to you is that the things that we all, you all have been dealing with, um, in terms of Medicare managed care, in terms of risk and bundling and all of those things in a more seamless approach, um, I don't think they're going away. I don't think they're going away under a new president and a new Congress. Um, and um, the net result of this, um, quite frankly and bluntly, is the recognition that payments are going to struggle um, because we have an increasing number of consumers who will require care and services um, that the government is paying at least a portion of the tab for. Um, and the revenue base for that is not increasing. I want to move on to something else that's happening and um, put this in the context of new forms of competition. I'm just selecting out um, Kensington, which is a, a really good organization worth tracking. Um, I, I don't intend for you to read the small print over on the right, but if you're interested, um, you, can, you can hit their website and, and see what they've categorized as what makes us different. Um, but I, I highlighted out on the left-hand side um, one of their areas of focus. So this is Kensington, assisted living, and their focus is rehab, multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's disease, ALS, and you could go through um, a longer list of those things. Um, for those who have been in the field more than five years, you'd probably say, wait a minute, that's what nursing homes have done um, for a long time. The point being that, I mean, I think as we all knew back in uh, 2000 and 1995, assisted living continues to take market share um, away from skilled care. This is a slide I've used in a number of presentations. Um, I wish I could find a better one, but in September of 2014, the headline in Forbes was of a tech elite plan to reinvent senior care. And I've said fairly frequently, I'd actually prefer that senior care be reinvented by somebody who understands it 
Um, but bluntly, I, I don't think that's going to happen, um, and uh, at least not fast enough. And, and a primary reason for that is when you're unburdened by debt, um, unburdened by buildings, by commitments and responsibilities to residents or patients and responsibilities to staff, um, your creativity and your innovation um, can make great uh, leaps. Um, when you're, when you're um, bounded by those things, um, the, the innovation, um, the funding, um, the creativity has limitations to it. So I think we fight um, the perspective from the outside of, uh, of how they view the field and, and how they view what the consumer is looking for. Um, I think pretty well known, um, certainly for the last couple of decades, is that long-term care tends to follow the acute care world. So when you see here, and, and um, this is uh, Johns Hopkins, um, when you see the, uh, the headline, hospital care and the comfort at home, um, or hospitals without beds, which I'll show you in, in a moment, um, I think it's a fair question for us to be asking ourselves in our field, um, are we next? Um, what are the implications of that? So I pulled a tweet from Michelle Kentz, who is um, a, um, a very effective um, CEO of Leading Age New Jersey. Um, and she's talking here about the bedless hospital, um, which is frankly not new, except it's got a different label. If you think about the, the volume of outpatient service that hospitals are doing and have been doing for a couple of decades, it's not new. Uh, on the other hand, it, it, I think, asks us in the field to ask the same question. At what point does the hospital bedlessness become the nursing home who's um, looking toward more bedless type of approaches? Um, one of the things I've, I've noticed is I've asked this question, and I've asked it of my students, I've asked it of different boards and leadership teams that I work with, um, is that, um, and, and my typical question is, um, do you think we'll ever have a bedless nursing home? And, and by the way, it's a trick question. <laughs> Do you think we'll ever have a bedless nursing home? Um, and if so, what will it look like? Um, the answers come a lot easier to people who have not been uh, in the field for very long, which I, I think confirms what I was um, suggesting before. And, and the reason I mentioned it was a trick question was that if you go back to the roots of PACE, uh, Program of All-Inclusive Care for the Elderly, um, it was intended to be, and um, in many ways is, um, a nursing home diversion program uh, available to somebody who's Medicare and Medicaid eligible, but who otherwise would be in a nursing home. So um, I tongue-in-cheek said, um, talk about bedless nursing homes because, frankly, they, they're already here. The question is, how will they accelerate? Now, if you look really closely at your screen, um, and if you look at the gentleman who's standing, you should be able to see the image of a person um, that's behind him. Now, the reason I show you this um, isn't some sci-fi um, sort of theory that I'm going to pursue. This was the, the gentleman who's standing was a, a candidate for president of France. And when he announced um, that he was running for president, he made his announcement in two places at the same time. Um, one, he was there in person. Um, and the other, he was there by hologram. Now, I would encourage you to think about um, when holograms drop from a million dollars an hour to, let's say, a hundred dollars an hour, what would they be used for in a long-term care setting? What implication would they have when we think about how we staff and how we communicate um, with patients and families? So we're going to move now to um, complacency. And my observation would be, and I'm, and I'm not being critical, I, I, no, I suppose I am in a way, um, but I'll say observationally, I think complacency tends to be more of a uh, challenge for the not-for-profit community than the for-profit. Um, but nevertheless, it affects both sides of our field, um, particularly those who are successful, because once you're, when you're successful, it's, it's difficult to think about a model that you've used to gain that success um, being under fire. So a book that I frequently recommend at the end of Competitive Advantage, I pick out two um, quotes from here. Um, McGrath, who's a professor at Columbia, talks about stability, not change, is the state that's most dangerous in highly dynamic competitive environments. Um, and then she goes on to um, quote uh, somebody who was a, an observer 
of the telecommunications field, which was um, absolutely and perhaps forever disrupted by Apple when it introduced the iPhone um, in 2007. And just as a reminder, Apple at that point was not a telecommunications company. Um, and so I, I look at our field and say, I think we're ripe for an iPhone moment. Um, McGrath quotes one of the analysts talking about Nokia, who had the technology, by the way, before um, the smartphone technology before Apple did. Their biggest problem is complacency. In fact, they're actually complacent about their attitude toward complacency. There's some, some that would say that the same um, is true of our field. One of the reasons for it, if, if you agree with me that complacency is a risk and there's some um, prevalence of it within our field, um, is the roadblock that was caused by certificate of need. And um, certificate of need was started as a way to control cost. It, it continues in, in a number of states today. It's been done away with in other states. But what it did to our field, it did to our industry, was it gave us the false um, delusion um, that um, there would always be a market for nursing homes. And the reason I say that is the certificate of need was intended to only allow nursing home beds to be built when there was a need. Well, the world has changed, um, and the utilization has changed. But sometimes our mindset about um, marketing um, and the approach to strategy has not changed. So it leads me to um, the substantive, or the additional substantive comment, um, which is, what should we do? Um, we can um, wring our hands and say, well, I, I hope he's not right. Um, we can say that, um, well, he's right, but it'll, it'll ha happen incrementally, and by then I'll, I'll figure it out. Um, all of this could be true, but, but that's not a way to prepare for the future. This is a, um, a graphic I took from a book that's called Your Strategy Needs a Strategy. Um, not necessarily a book that I would recommend, but um, it provided an interesting graphic, which is um, somewhere over 150 um, different ways to develop strategy. And, and they're suggesting in the book that depending upon where you are as an organization um, should lead you to conclude what type of strategy you'll need. Um, I show this to students as, as I start the course on strategy that I teach to say um, there may be over 150. We're going to focus on five um, in this course. And the one that, that I want to focus on this afternoon, as you know, um, is blue ocean strategy. But um, whether it's um, blue ocean or some form of strategy that, that you're very conversant with and, and you want to use, um, I would endorse any uh, form of strategy as long as it does a couple of things, and actually more than a couple. And so these are my guiding principles. Um, Henry Mintzberg, who's a professor at McGill, um, not necessarily well known outside of the um, management and strategy field, um, introduced the notion that a strategy can be emergent, meaning that we might wake up one day and figure out that what we've been doing for the last two years is actually working, um, and we ought to accelerate it or we ought to expand it. And we shouldn't feel bad that it wasn't something that we intentionally um, decided we were going to grow two years ago, but it just kind of happened. And deliberate is, is um, the opposite. Deliberate is, hey, we've, you know, we've, we've done this for a while. We've had a think tank looking at it. We've got lots of data. Um, and we should only pursue deliberate strategies. And so my comment is that the strategy making um, should be open to the emergence approach, uh, but should also be disciplined to um, try to arrive at the deliberate approach, too. Um, I'm a big believer in vision. If an organization doesn't know where it's heading, um, is going to have difficulty ultimately in deciding what its strategies ought to be because it'll be chasing the dollar or it'll be chasing something else that may have um, much more short-term volatility. Um, I like Hintmansburg's comment about learning um, plays the crucial role in the development of novel strategies. And that's a reminder to us that you know whether we've been in this field for 30 years or, or 30 minutes, um, but there's a lot to be learned about what's going on outside of our walls. And just because we're successful doesn't mean that we might not be more successful if we looked at what was happening and somebody else might be innovating. Synthesis is um, a term that's used um, to describe really um, the ability to take vast amounts of information and to integrate them into a few items um, that are meaningful takeaways. Too often in strategy making, we get caught up with um, 100 pages of uh, tables and exhibits, um, missing the fact that um, what we really need 
is the meaning and the analysis that comes out of it. Um, and that's the hard work of, of synthesis. And the last point um, I would make um, is the importance of disconfirmation. And that's a term uh, that McGrath uses. Um, and, you know, we all suffer from, it's um, human nature, quite frankly, uh, to suffer from confirmation bias. Um, it's actually been proved, um, certainly in the last year, in the last election cycle. cycle. And if you look at where people get their news and, and, and what they subscribe to, uh, in terms of their Twitter feeds or, or Facebook or, or otherwise. They tend to look for sources of news, sources of information um, that will confirm what they already think. Well, in our field, it, there's been no more important time to seek the exact opposite of that than right now. Um, you know, we should be open to saying, hey, we've been, we've been doing great, but what is it that's out there that could cause us um, to, to take a turn for the worse? And, and how would we know that that was happening? And I guess, and I mentioned that was the last one. I'm going to throw one more thing uh, in here. Um, sometimes I see organizations um, who want to develop such a concrete and detailed approach to strategy um, that it can, uh, in their mind, be unerring. If we follow these, this exact path uh, from start to finish, we'll have to arrive at the right result. And I would argue that that's, um, that's not true. And there's a, um, there's a consulting practice, and I won't name them, who are busily trying to what they call productize um, their strategy or strategic planning approach. And I think that's exactly wrong, because if you take those guiding principles, what it's really saying is you'll use tools that are available to you. Keep an open mind um, and see where it takes you. And that the process itself um, is as valuable as um, the outcome because that's where the learning will happen. So when I introduce Blue Ocean Strategy, I, I, I tell people, and I'm, and I'm saying to you, um, it's, a, it's a very, I was about to say it's a very good book. It's, there's, there's five really good chapters in this longer book. Now, that's not a, a criticism, because many business books, um, frankly, um, are comprised of one or two good chapters, but you can't sell one or two uh, good chapters and call it a book. So authors uh, in business books in particular tend to group a lot of redundancy and uh, applications and uh, other items into a book. Well, there's five good chapters in Blue Ocean. They're the first five, um, in case you're wondering. And they, um, they give us some uh, tools that we can use. Um, and, and so some people say, well, Scott, you know, can I get that from a Harvard Business Review article? And yeah, you, you, you kind of can. But you, you're really going to need, if, if you decide that this is something you want to um, work through. You're, you're really going to want to have the, the detail that comes out of those first five chapters. So what I'm going to do this afternoon um, is give you the overview. Um, and this is specifically for those of you who have not worked with Blue Ocean before. Um, I'm going to take some deep dives into a couple of different areas. And in particular, um, I'm going to end up talking about the strategy canvas, because I think that that's, uh, that may be the most important um, a piece that you can take away both this seminar um, and also the book. So as the uh, previous slide said, um, the distinction that they make between red ocean and blue ocean is the blue ocean is where there's uncontested market space. Now, some of you may kind of be laughing and go, yeah, would that be the case? Um, but as with many things, having an aspiration, even if the aspiration is ultimately unachievable, um, isn't a bad way to start out. Um, the other observation, and I'll pause here and say that um, the, the book really has nothing to do um, with aging services. Um, and yet, frankly, it has everything to do with aging services. It just happens to be the fact that the authors haven't written about it. Um, but that's where we, as um, providers, as students, as adopters, as potential adopters, that's where we come into play, um, is making the connection. And so the observation they make is that brands are generally becoming more similar. And as they are uh, becoming more similar, uh, people increasingly select based on price. Um, there's a lot of truth to that comment. Um, sometimes I show an image of um, what many people assume to be Cheerios, and I call them out on it. I say, no, it's oat cereal. And, and uh, that the consumer can't tell the difference between Cheerios and oat cereal, and if they're motivated by price, they're going to go with oat cereal. 
So um, Kim and Moburn, who are the authors of Blue Ocean, are basically saying to us, you need to have something that's truly unique. Um, and when I do interviews, as we start strategic planning processes, and I interview board members and leadership, and, uh, and others, I ask them what's unique about the organization, invariably they're wrong. Um, they'll first tell me 90% um, will say that they're unique, and, and then when I ask them what is it that makes them unique, 90% um, of what they cite as uniqueness isn't really unique at all, it's just that they haven't gotten out of their building or they haven't gotten out of their organization. And I think a, a telling um, takeaway here is, and this is based on the research that they've done, is that um, they indicate there's no perpetually excellent companies or industries. And they would go on to say there's only, per, um, there's only excellent strategies. And those strategies are evolving. So um, you'll have this graph or this, this chart. I, I want to cover just a couple of things um, that are here. Um, first one would be um, this value cost trade-off. Because I want to introduce you to this, and then I'm going to show you how it works. And it's basically saying, in order to give sort of the old way of thinking, the red ocean way of thinking, is in order to give someone value, it just by necessity has to be more expensive. Because it's going to be more complex, or it's going to be better, or it's going to be a combination of all of, all of both of those items. And Blue Ocean says, well, hang on a second. Because if you're doing things that you, you don't really need to be doing, and you stop doing them, you stop offering them to the consumer, and you really focus on what they were looking for, you can actually bring down the cost of what you're doing, what you're offering, while bringing the consumer more, more value. The, um, the other, is I'll, I'll go back up here, um, is uh, exploiting existing demand. And, and here's where, um, you know, gosh, you know, when we attend um, ACA meetings or leading age meetings and we talk about competition and knowing them, and I did a webinar for caring.com a couple of weeks ago, and the whole webinar is about um, understanding your competition. And yes, it's important. Um, but one of the essential themes of Blue Ocean is um, what they refer to, I think, once in the book, and I've picked it up, is uh, the essential non-customer that in order to expand the base, to expand the market, um, that you need to find those people who, uh, at all costs, um, are not coming to you, or for whatever reason, have chosen um, not to come to you. So we'll talk a little bit about, about that as, as well. Now, the thesis of Blue Ocean and the, and the research portion of it, portion of it is um, that, um, uh, and, and let me pause for a second. Um, and you probably all know, you know as you read a business book, you, you understand that most of what's being given to us is things that we already know, but being packaged differently. And there's nothing wrong with that, um, because sometimes the packaging is what gets our attention and enables us to communicate a new approach or a new way of, of doing things. So that's, that's fine. Um, particularly for strategy books, um, the author of the book is usually promoting a new way of thinking or a new way of developing strategy. Um, and because it's a new way, they don't have a hundred examples of where it's worked because if a hundred times it had worked, they'd probably be too late writing the book. So what, has, what tends to happen is people go backwards and they say, um, well, if you had used this kind of strategy or if this business had used this kind of strategy, this is what their result would have been. So Blue Ocean is no different, um, and that, I don't offer that up as a criticism. Just realize that, um, and I'll do it this afternoon. I'll talk about a greenhouse um, and greenhouse project. Um, they say that 14% uh, of the business launches over the period of time that they studied um, were uh, launches that created Blue Oceans under their definition. That 86% um, were launches that would be the traditional red ocean, um, and uh, then drop to the bottom, um, and they say, um, if 14% were blue oceans, 61% um, 61 of the profit came from the blue ocean companies. So their, um, their thesis is, few blue ocean startups, but they were generating most of the profit. Um, if it's true, that should have our attention. Um, and I say that whether we're for profit or not for profit. Um, let me start to introduce the strategy canvas. Um, the book um, will give you a variety of tools, as I mentioned uh, probably a couple times already, 
Um, this is, to me, the most important takeaway from the book, the most important tool. Um, and it's a diagnostic framework, and it's an action framework. It's diagnostic in the sense that it makes us look at the industry um, and where our competition is and where we fit within that. Um, and then it um, enables us to focus on action because it allows us to think differently um, about the way the industry works today. Um, a lot of words in the second um, bullet point. I, I really want to focus on the last one. Um, if it, it captures the current state of play in the known market space. Um, when I show you, but I'm just going to pop it up for a moment because this is what I'm talking about. This down here are competitive factors. All right, so just, and here it's price, meals, lounges, seating choices, hub, friendly service, fee, frequent departures. This is going to be up Southwest and, and airlines. So go back. Um, so they say that in defining those competitive factors, which is the important first step uh, of creating a strategy canvas, and my hope is by the end of uh, our webinar today, you'll be comfortable doing that. Um, you identify the factors that the industry currently competes on. Um, and what customers receive. I'm going to embellish that a bit. The authors may not agree with me, um, but it's also what potential customers are thinking about. If they have a particular need, how would they make a decision? Um, and it's the weaving together of that, those two items. How, how does a consumer think? Um, and what's the competition um, investing in currently that gives you the, uh, com the competitive um, factors? So um, you might be about to gain um, an insight that sometimes I'm cynical about business books. I am, um, only because Southwest is an example that's used in almost all of them, um, despite the fact that it was um, a, a product of probably none of them. Um, but in any event, um, it's used uh, in uh, Blue Ocean Strategy. And um, what it was essentially saying, um, here, a couple of important factors was the things: um, price, meals, lounges, seating choices, and the number of hubs, hubs rather, that um, the traditional airlines competed on. So they were scoring the industry high on all of those. That's where they make their investment. Um, they said here, well, wait a minute. If if we want to reach that essential non-customer. We have to reach the person who would have otherwise driven, but if we give them something that has value to them, they'll fly. And that expands the market. So um, supposedly they sat down and said, what would that consumer value? And they came up with friendly service, speed, the frequency of departures. In other words, you know, kind of snap your finger, snap your finger. If I can get there quicker on an airline than I could driving, and the price, was lower, was was lower than these airlines. But even if it was a little bit higher than um, if I was driving, that's what I ought to do. So these three were added, saying nobody's really paying attention to this. Uh, seating choices, as you'll know, having lounges, uh, and having um, these monstrous hubs were viewed as unimportant. So um, allegedly, Southwest said we're not going to invest in them. And if we don't invest in these things, we can keep our price lower than the traditional airline. Um, similarly, Yellowtail Wine, um, at some points, uh, was, was said to have seen an opportunity between the low cost, um, almost undrinkable wines, um, and the high price premium wines that, you know, if you weren't dedicating yourselves to reading a wine book a week, you, you may not understand why it would be valuable to pay $35 or $50 for a bottle of wine. And they said there must be a market in between those two. And so here they identify, um, or the Bob rather, uh, they've identified what the competitive factors are along here. I won't read them to you. And then they said, well, wait a minute. Um, people just want to drink wine. They, there's some large percentage that likely um, aren't that interested in learning about it. Um, and um, the easy drinking, the ease of selection, um, and maybe even some fun and, and adventure um, might be part of the buying decision. So that's where they invest. Um, and in terms of um, 
terminology and um, a lot of marketing, paid advertising in magazines and TV and, and those kind of things and the quality of aging, we're not going to invest in any of that. Um, that's where the value cost trade-offs came. Where they're invested, they're not going to invest. So that's referred to as the four actions framework. You don't have to remember those words because you'll, you'll have this. But the questions are, which factors, which of those competitor, competitive factors should be reduced well below the industry standards where, where pe other people are investing? Which ones should be uh, eliminated? Which ones um, people are still investing in it, they're still offering it, but it turns out that the consumer is really not that interested, but nobody's called them on it. Which factors should be raised? Um, and perhaps most importantly, which factors ought to be created? So the first part of the exercise is you create the strategy based on the existing competitive factors. You do that um, based on what you see the industry investing in. In order to do that, you've got to be very objective and, and not dismissive of your competition. You've got to look broadly at what the, what the industry is doing. And then you kind of you need to get yourself into the head of the consumer. And there's obviously a number of ways to do that. Um, but I typically refer to it as talking to the live humans, understanding the people who are making decisions about long-term care, about care for mom and dad, uh, or care for themselves in, in some situations, um, and understand what their thoughts are, what their fears are, um, and recognize that they don't have the expertise that you have. So they're not going to be able to articulate necessarily what they want, but they can tell you how they might make a decision. So I highlighted here um, how that um, eliminate, reduce, raise, create, uh, four actions framework um, worked for yellowtail wine. Um, and you can see uh, here on the left hand side uh, eliminating the enological or the wine type terminology and distinction that if you didn't know the terminology, you'd be embarrassed to ask somebody about it. Uh, aging qualities and a very significant investment um, in what they refer to as above the line marketing. Um, reduce the investment uh, that's made in the complexity. The range of wines, in other words, don't have to offer 15 different wines, maybe three will do. Um, and, and don't bother promoting or investing in the prestige of the vineyard. Think more about the masses um, than the, uh, the minority who would actually even understand who the vineyard is and who's behind it. Um, raise the price versus budget wines. Um, and involve the stores. They call it below the mine marketing, um, much more than you're paying for advertising. So you might incent the store, um, you know, for example, um, I was going to almost ask you, but I, I realize we, we can't have this conversation. Um, but, um, you know, in, the, in some of the first yellowtail wine placements, they had a, um, a large kangaroo cutout. Um, and they brought that to the stores and said, um, we'll put one outside, we'll put one inside. Do you think this will help your marketing? They said, yeah, well, what, what the heck, why not? Um, and then the last three, which we talked about earlier. Okay. Um, last piece of Blue Ocean, I know I'm going fast, but I want, to, I want to get to Greenhouse, and then I want to allow some time toward the end for questions. Focus. Um, the organization doesn't diffuse its efforts across all key factors of competition. I'm going to show you the illustration of what that means in just a moment. Divergence. The value curve diverges from the other players. And then the compelling tagline. Now, I'll tell you um, that when I first um, became a student of Blue Ocean, I got to the last one and said to myself, oh my gosh, that's just a cliche. But it, it really is not. Now, let me go back. I'm going to use um, this strategy canvas for Southwest. Focus. This is the focus. There are three areas that Southwest sets are going to invest in. Divergence. Here's a variety of areas where the traditional airlines are investing that Southwest decided not to. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, actually Southwest has had a variety of taglines. One of them was the speed of the plane at the price of the car whenever you need it. So focus, divergence, 
and a compelling tagline. And the argument is that's what gives you the success of the ocean. This slide we really covered it. And now I want to I want to um, try to try to make this actionable. This is a strategy canvas that over time um, I developed with input from students, um, input from some folks who participated in one of um, uh, the Erickson School of UMBC Aging's um, uh, first memory care summits. Um, and it was, uh, where is the industry competing currently? And so um, the five areas that were identified, and, and by the way, when, uh, this will vary um, from market to market, and um, I'm not trying to be um, citing anything from you, but um, I always update this. So this is not exactly the, uh, the strategy canvas that I, I would use. And frankly, I, I wanted you to, to feel like you needed to invest in developing a strategy canvas based on your perspectives and not just take uh, some professor or consultant's perspective on it. So price, meeting an acute or immediate need, you know, having a person in the hospital who grabs the, um, the, the patient or the family. Convenience and location, is it close to um, where the patient lives, is it close to where the family lives? Um, reputation um, and uh, the appeal of the environment, the building. So this is where I score things. Um, and um, so I said the industry's um, beginning to make more of an investment uh, in the physical part. Uh, that reputation and relationships have become more important, particularly with the five-star uh, rating system and whether we're a, a believer in it um, or an opponent to it, it's, it's out there. But I said, I, you know, I don't see a lot of investment happening there yet. I, I see a lot of talk there. Um, certainly, um, the, the uh, proximity to family is really important and that's very saleable. Um, and the immediate need. We can, we can admit you today and the hospital wants to discharge you um, in 12 hours or six hours. That becomes really important. So the scoring here, um, somewhat arbitrary, um, but seven and a half, seven, and I drop it to two, um, means how much, how significant is the investment that's being made? Or um, how much does the consumer um, invest in this? Now, the, uh, and this is uh, an important outlier to what I just told you. The, the only uh, time when that doesn't apply is price. And what I mean by that is um, when you score price, it's, it's meant to be scored on the absolute. Is a nursing home expensive? Answer, yes. So therefore, it has the highest score. Where you might say, well, gee, well, wait a minute. If, if I was trying to offer a discounted price, wouldn't I score that higher? And the answer is no. It's a flaw in the canvas. Um, so just keep that in mind as, as you're doing it. So for me, that would be the traditional nursing home. Then we've got four actions framework. Okay, well, how does this apply? Which factors should be reduced? Which ones um, has our industry taken for granted but they should be eliminated? Which ones should we invest in? Um, which ones should we create based on our knowledge of the consumer that maybe nobody else has stopped to think about because they're still consumed a certificate of need protects them um, from a diminishing market. So this is how um, I would illustrate greenhouses um, versus the typical um, nursing home using the strategy canvas. And by the way, this is not how um, greenhouses were developed, but as with many business books, it's kind of looking backward. Um, so I said, well, okay, we won't eliminate any of the factors. They still have some role. Um, you might argue with that and disagree. Um, let's look at the greenhouse research and recognize that meeting an acute or immediate need, yeah, we can still do that. That's important. But it doesn't drive everything we do because we've got a product and an approach um, that the consumer has a lot more interest in than the typical uh, nursing home. Location and convenience becomes less important because there's some research that suggests uh, folks will come from a longer distance. Um, to have their parents or grandparents, uh, loved ones, served in a greenhouse. Let's raise the importance of reputation. Let's raise the environmental appeal. And let's raise the price, if we want to, if, if, we, if we think that the market will support it. And let's create um, two new competitive factors. One is the empowered, passionate staff. And you can think of other adjectives that describe that. Um, and let's create a factor called the proof of outcomes, because we know that um, 
depending on um, the marketplace, just saying that we're the best in the market um, isn't going to cut it. And so the proof of outcomes, um, both in quality of care and quality of life, become important. So um, plotting out, this is the original uh, strategy canvas. I've um, did incremental appeal. That's where red, if you recall, was the traditional nursing. Yeah, you might you might push it hard. You don't have to take great person-centered care, but I left it as a two. You could push it where you like. Um, and proof of outcomes. We've certainly come a long way in the last two two and a half years in recognizing that it's not good enough for us to say to the health system or an HCO care. Yeah, we're really good because they already know our readmissions and they know our length of stay and they know um, a lot of things about us even if we don't. And then I plotted the greenhouse. Um, and so the value cost trade-off um, is um, people will come to us um, and we may not have to invest as much uh, in the immediacy. We may not have to have those, uh, those folks uh, roaming the halls of the hospital uh, as the image of the greenhouse continues to rise around the country. And location and convenience are less important um, because, again, we've got evidence that folks will come from a longer distance. So that's what I would refer to as divergence. Divergence. Focus, reputation and relationships. Um, and what we know is that any time there's an article like the one in Politico or there's a, uh, something done on the radio at uh, NPR or somewhere else, there's a spike of activity um, on the Greenhouse website and the adopters' websites. The environmental appeal is um, really second to none. It's, it's hard to question um, that when you're looking for a place for your, uh, for your loved one. Um, the empowered, um, passionate staff um, and the proof of outcomes. And, and frankly, maybe all of these are tense, um, but I, I wanted to score them here. Um, and the proof of outcomes becomes important because um, for at least a dozen years, Greenhouse Project was working to confirm that its approach worked. Um, that it was not only financially viable, but it was also something that led to a better quality of life and better and a better quality of care. And so, the peer network, um, which is a part of the greenhouse, um, is doing that internally. And then, the, which you, you might look at their um, the website, the Thrive Research, which was done by a consortium of researchers, uh, demonstrating that as well. This is a, a survey that was done um, through Aja a couple of years ago. Um, on greenhouse adopters, small houses, and uh, households. So it, it is all three of those. And what's important here is that of those adopters, 78% said it's easier to capture market share, and two-thirds said its staff satisfaction is higher. I would have started the, the webinar and said, um, um, capture market share, higher staff satisfaction, and then just ended it. Because I don't know anyone who, who wouldn't look at those two things and say, tell me more. Um, that's where I, I need to be. So I'm going to go back to and then, and then see what uh, questions you might have. I'm going to go back to the elements of strategy that Tim and Moburn uh, suggest in their book. Focus. Organization doesn't diffuse its efforts. That's here. Divergence. The value curve diverges from the other players. Very much here. The compelling tagline. And, and for Greenhouse, it's real home, meaningful life, empowered staff. Um, last comment on this and, and see if any of you have submitted questions. Last comment on this would, would be um, the, the strategy canvas isn't a simple sit down, I'll figure it out in five minutes and I'll have my answer. It takes work. It takes, it takes work and it takes objectivity. Um, it's work in the sense that collecting information that goes beyond what your perception of the industry is is, is um, not only helpful, it's, it's really critical to this. It also takes work because um, you're probably going to develop multiple um, strategy canvases. So for example, if, if you're thinking, well, should we build greenhouses or should we maintain our old style nursing home, you could use this strategy canvas or some version of it and um, it would lead you to a conclusion that you probably ought to be thinking about greenhouse. If you're at that decision point that says, I already know I'm going to get rid of my old nursing home, I'm just trying to make a decision whether I should do it on a household model or a small house. Um, you're probably going to want to think through um, this last one. What's, how important is the proof of outcomes and the access to that research? If you say, you know what, 
too much of this sounds like long-term care and I'm really in the short stay rehab business, you're going to want to do another um, strategy canvas. If you're a, a life plan community, you're probably going to want to do one for nursing and you want to do one for your overall community. And, and ultimately, you, you may want to do one. The, the, the reason you want to do one for the overall community is the importance of health care in the resident decision making when they're moving to the independent living portion of the campus may be more of an issue than we might think it is. Um, so we want to make sure that that's plugged in. Um, and you might want to include other levels of care um, as well. So um, much like uh, many webinars, many seminars, many books, um, my intent was to introduce you um, to the Blue Ocean approach to hopefully lead you to a, a road of thinking that um, it's, a, um, it's a fairly turbulent time, even if it's playing out um, incrementally um, at points. And that strategy is more important today than it's ever been. And that Blue Ocean might be a way um, to think differently about the future and might be a way to, to cause us to introduce disconfirmation as a thought process into what frequently, um, and I'm talking about strategic planning, what frequently is a, a process that, that tends to lean more toward confirmation than disconfirmation. So Rachel or Susan, did we get any questions? I will defer to Rachel. I think she was monitoring. I see it looks like two in the chat box. The only thing I see is um, mm -hmm. compelling tagline, an example. Okay. Let me go back here. Uh, so I gave you the greenhouse uh, example. I skipped that. Um, so the yellowtail uh, compelling tagline was good wine that everyone can enjoy every day. Um, and one of the taglines that Southwest used, we made it simple and fun to fly. So the compelling tagline is not our mission statement. Um, and I say that whether you're for-profit or not for-profit, because typically that's too long. But it's something short and sweet that we might be dismissive of, as I was um, early in my study of Blue Ocean only to recognize that the consumer will never take as much time to understand who we are as we would hope them to. So we've got to package it for them in a way that's um, not only short and sweet, um, and, I, and I apologize for those of you who might be from Peace Church organizations, but also smacks them across the back of the head with a two by four, um, and a compelling tagline will do that. That's Awesome. Thank you, Scott. Um, I, I think you, for me, you defined well our current situation, the trends that we find ourselves in, as well as kind of what to do. And I really resonated when you said we are ripe for an iPhone moment. And I think it would behoove all of us to give this uh, type of strategic thinking and process um, some real uh, time and, and energy around here. Um, as Scott mentioned, you will receive a recording and a PDF of his slides today, as well as Scott's contact information. So if you continue to have questions or thoughts that you'd like to kick around with Scott, uh, his contact information, there you go, it's on a slide right there, will be available to you. In addition to that, um, I want to remind those of you on the call that we have other upcoming webinars. On the 11th of April, there is an overview webinar of the Greenhouse Model. On the 20th of April, there is a, a webinar on the greenhouse model meets PACE. And Scott made a reference to the PACE model. And we've had our first um, PACE model open at, in two greenhouse homes. So you'll want to hear about that. On the 25th of April, it's how to finance greenhouse homes, what's happening in the current situation, uh, given where we are. And so Capital Impact Partners will be doing a webinar on that. At the end of the month, we have a workshop at John Knox Village in Pompano Beach, Florida. I think the end of April is a great time to get to South Florida. Um, John Knox Village built 12 greenhouse homes. They have five that are dedicated to short-term rehab, and the other seven are for long stay. So to Scott's point made earlier, if you want to see how post-acute or short-term rehab functions in a greenhouse model, um, and see it firsthand, uh, John Knox Village on April 27th would be a, a place you might want to go. So with that, I thank you again, Scott, for sharing your wisdom, your expertise, for 
being somewhat provocative, inspirational, and really giving us a roadmap for success. And I thank all of you who were on the call today. Really appreciate your being a part of this. And with that, have a fabulous afternoon.